Attorney Joe. Okay. I'll call to order the uh, CDTA board meeting for March 29th. Uh, we'll get started by uh, getting a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting. So moved. Thank you, Mike. Second. Thank you, Denise. Uh, hopefully everybody's read it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Well, good. We'll start with committee reports. Uh, the Board Operations Committee. Here's the report from the March 15th meeting. We reviewed the agenda and activities for all of our March meetings. Um, the authority has undertaken a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative that we will be hearing about towards the end of this meeting. Uh, and it will provide a path forward for a diverse workforce that CDTA has. Uh, Car provided a summary on the CEO uh, company work plan. He updated us on CDTA's major projects, including the uh, Gateway Mobility Hub at Schenectady, uh, which we will anticipate, which we anticipate to be completed by late summer. Uh, introduction of the electric bicycles to the CDPHP cycle fleet, and completion of the Purple Line uh, later this fall. Um, also, uh, we, we also asked for committee assignments and uh, board officers. I've uh, uh, put together a nominating committee led by Pat Lance to develop a slate of officers for the 23-24 fiscal year, and uh, the committee will present their recommendations at the next meeting. And I'm working with CARM on committee assignments, and we'll have that to you uh, shortly. Uh, we certainly appreciate all the help and time that everyone puts in as volunteers on the board. Appreciate the work. Uh, the next meeting of the committee is scheduled for uh, Wednesday, April 12, 9-15, right here at uh, 110 Broadway Avenue. Uh, unless there are any questions, we'll move on to the next committee. Uh, Denise Figueroa. Okay, thank you. Uh, the committee met last week, March 22nd, right here at 110 Water Bleed Avenue and on Teams. Uh, we have one consent agenda item today. Uh, it's approval of the procurement manual. Um, the staff provided the annual <coughs> review of the procurement manual. We had a good discussion on sole source awards and maintenance contracts that are supportive of prior uh, competitive procurements. With the cost of goods and services uh, increasing, we recommended raising the competitively procured board approval of contracts by $50,000. So uh, from $150,000 to $200,000. And change orders from $100,000 to $150,000. So we need a motion to approve the revisions to the procurement manual. So moved. And Joe? Second. Second, Jackie. Any questions about the procurement manual? Favorite topic of mine. <laughs> it, it was quite a lengthy discussion we had. <laughs> it, it was. It was. And, and you know, from a staff perspective, I appreciate that discussion because you know sometimes it, it sometimes can feel like it's you know box boxing things in, and uh, it's good to hear from the members on you know your your perspective on really the level of involvement that the committee and the board want want, want to, to see. So you know, most appreciated and. Frankly, we like a little pushback from time to time. Well, before the meeting, we were talking about procuring a larger table for board meetings. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pretty obvious here that full house. It's a full, when we have a full house, we have a bit of an issue. So, um, I'm sure we may have to competitively forget, uh, procure architectural services to figure out the table and, and how to engineer it. But um, we will get on that. I got a fold-up table. <laughs> Kids there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess Pete might go not being here. Pete might have to be the designated kids. But I wanted to make sure you all had a place to sit. That's, that's <laughs> nice. Thanks, Peter. Any uh, any any questions or comments about the procurement manual? The action. Yeah, that's here. If not, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It's approved. Okay, uh, the investment committee uh, met on March 22nd uh, prior to the committee meeting of uh, performance monitoring, and uh, we will be providing a quarterly report shortly to the board. Uh, we had uh, two administrative discussion items, uh, review of performance uh, metrics. Uh, Chris Destiny facilitated a conversation about the metrics that we use in the non-financial performance report. We reviewed um, these measures from time to time uh, to validate their relevance and their accuracy. Um, missed trips have been a challenge as they have been rising, but as a percentage, are relatively low. Chris
Chris recommends that we modify the chart to report percent of missed trips as a function of the total number of trips performed. The star trip denials have been at zero for a couple of years. And because of the way denials are defined, they will always be zero. And therefore, the metric is limited. Um, Chris recommends replacing the, the, the existing metric with a chart that accurately reflects uh, system quality for STAR. The new chart will show the number of clients supported outside the 25-minute window, uh, transport, excuse me, outside the 25-minute window, and the number of no-shows, as well as the number of clients not transported due to delays. Um, so these changes will be reflected in the next month's report. It was a good discussion about those uh, items. Thank you. Um, and then uh, we moved on to the financial report. Uh, Mike Collins gave the monthly management uh, report. Uh, the MRT was under budget for the second month in a row, but is still 20% over budget for the year. Uh, customer fair revenue continues to grow and is 27% over budget for the year. The, uh, the uh, Rensselaer Rail Station revenue continues to improve and is 45% over budget for the year. Wages were under budget this month because of less work days in February and continued uh, headcount challenges. Uh, for the year, uh, wages remain 3.7% under budget. Workers' compensation is 30% under budget for the year. And we are in a very good financial position as we close out the fiscal year. Um, or one month prior to it. Um, and then we, had, we, uh, we did not go over the usual monthly uh, non-financial report. Uh, Chris Desney had provided the previous uh, uh, metrics. And so uh, that packed that information bill is in the packets for all the board members. And our next meeting is April 19th. Here at Tim Water Relief and on Microsoft Teams. Thank you, Denise. Questions? Anybody have any questions for Denise about that meeting? We just on missed trips uh, and, and, and the star stuff. Missed trips here. What we're, you know, we're not running away from it. I mean, missed trips are wrong. You know, but we want to try to normalize that. You know, what we want to try to find is when should we get excited about it? You know, when, when, when is it too much? I think you know, really we're looking for sweet spots. And I think the way Chris is uh, posing to show it, you know, a good discussion about get and take. I think it's the right way to start. We can always change that. And on the start thing, you know, we all know that reporting zero is just not the right way to sort of evaluate sort of fall and stuff. So again, you know, let's look at these two or three things that Chris um, is suggesting. But I think as he's showing you, we have reams and reams and reams of data we can sort it every which way to Sunday. So if that doesn't work, we can you know come back and redefine it again and look at something else. But we just say there were zero missed trips to start. Or just not being accurate. Yeah. Well, I think everybody in the room could come up with a chart that they would want. But, you know, we'd have to stop someplace and have to stop. Yeah. That's why we've got Chris. He's, well, he's, he's online. He's, on, he's in his office. He said, uh, that's right, I want to sit in Georgie's seat and try to get mad. So, <laughs> he's, he's up there somewhere. But we'll keep playing with those, those, those uh, measurements. Great. All right, we'll move on to uh, the <coughs> committee community and stakeholder relations uh, report from Jackie Peltico. Thank you. Uh, the Community and Stakeholder Relations Committee met on March 23rd, 1115 a.m. here at 110 Waterloo and also on Microsoft Teams. Staff provided updates on three items. The first item, CARM provided a summary of advocacy efforts for the 2023 legislative season. Meetings with legislators at both the local and state level continue. Our message of growth and expansion is a central theme of our conversations as we await the state budget. The second item uh, was about the employee act link. Jamie Caslow updated us on the uh, rollout of that that happened eight months ago. The link was rolled out as a way to keep the entire workforce connected and updated on company news, operations, and employee engagement opportunities. To date, nearly 70% of the workforce has downloaded the app. Uh, the third and final item was the uh, monthly earned media and community engagement report provided by Jamie as well. Last month, CDTA earned 20 media placements in television, newspaper, and radio. Stories focused on the annual State of CDTA events, the progress on the purple-lined ERT, 
the uh, March Madness Shuttle Service, and a new Universal Access Partnership. CBTA partnered um, in a number, or sorry, participated in a number of local and national events to showcase its workforce to the community. One of those events, Transit Worker Appreciation Day, was celebrated on March 18th. Each year, CBTA marks the occasion by saying thank you to its workforce in several ways. Looking ahead, uh, CBTA will celebrate Earth Day on April 22nd and gear up to kick off Season 7 of CBTHP Cycle this spring. The next meeting of the committee will be held on Thursday, April 20th at 11.30 a.m. by Microsoft Teams and um, I'm also here at 1 p.m. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. Uh, strategic and Operational Planning Committee, Microsoft. <coughs> yes, thanks, Jamie. Uh, the committee met last Thursday here at 110 Waterbury Net via Microsoft Teams. Uh, we have one consent agenda item for the board today and one administrative discussion item. And before I present the, uh, the budget to the board, uh, Mike Collins wants to give us a brief uh, preview of the budget. Sure thing. I think uh, Vanessa's bringing it up right now. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so I know that we have talked about our budget for the past several months, and some of you have heard this uh, a few times. Um, but I just wanted to give a quick uh, overview of some highlights of our revenues and expenses of our operating and capital plan. Um, you know, we have a balanced budget of $126 million. Uh, customer revenue is significantly up this year um, to the point where we are um, um, increasing our line by 4.3 million to uh, 19 million. Uh, this is the highest ever we've had a customer revenue projection at. Uh, so we're way past COVID as far as I'm concerned now. Um, rental and rail station and facilities were increasing by 1.1 million. We have uh, Amtrak customers continue to come back, so therefore they're using our parking more. Um, our leases are now fully restored, and we actually have a parking increase uh, going into effect uh, next week. Um, and then on the uh, New York State STOA, our state operating assistance, the governor's executive budget has proposed a 7.1% 7 .1 increase to our state operating assistance to bring it to 55.7 million dollars. And then on the expense side, just some highlights here. You know, wages and benefits, they make up 70% of our budget. Most of our revenue is paying for our, our people. <coughs> our number one resource is our people, and they operate, they maintain, and manage our, our company. Uh, we're, uh, our assumption is we're going to have a 4.1% wage increase. That will accommodate uh, the new purple line that starts in the fall, and also a modest increase uh, for employee wages. Uh, purchase transportation, it's up 16%. Uh, this primarily consists of two star vendors uh, for paratransit services, and also our Northway Express and our Thruway Express contractor. Um, and this is mainly because or due to um, we're outsourcing more work um, because of the manpower challenges we've had all year and continue to have, and I know we spent a lot of committee time talking about the different manpower challenges we've had. Uh, lastly, on the expense side, fuel is up $1.8 million uh, due to market volatility, uh, really high inflation, and world events. Um, so we're, we went from $1.7, we will go from $1.76 to $3.05 per gallon starting in June. So um, that kind of summarizes just the operating budget. And go to the next slide here. Uh, this is just a kind of snapshot of our fiscal 24 capital plan here. Uh, this past year, we received uh, two electric grants. Um, and basically, we construct our infrastructure to increase our charging capacity. Um, it also includes things like uh, replacing a transformer, uh, obtaining some new switch gear, and in the out years, uh, we'll be able to order uh, 16 electric buses. Um, you'll see the pylon there uh, of the purple line. Um, we're finishing construction on that this year, and we will be rolling out the, the start of the new purple line you know, later this fall. 
Uh, also, we have our what I would call our first real mo mobility hub called the Gateway in Schenectady. Um, in fact, construction starts on that next week. And then finally, uh, the fleet replacement. We do an, our annual fleet replacement, which we will purchase about and replace 30 vehicles this year. So all told, that's just kind of a quick overview, quick summary of our operating capital plans. Um, <coughs> if anybody has any questions, I'm you know, here to answer them. But I'm going to turn it back over to Mike so we can go through your notes here, make all the proper recommendations. All right. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. All right. So uh, the proposed operating plan is balanced at $126 million based on our revenue and expense assumptions. The five-year capital plan provides a vision of projects and opportunities, including a new facility on the west side of our service network. Customer revenue is up in part due to our universal access program and marketing efforts to develop more relationships. We project to increase this line by $4.3 million. Revenue at the Rensselaer Rail Station is improving. Amtrak customers are using our parking facilities. Leases are restored, and we implement new parking rates on April 3, 2023. We project $1.3 million in new revenue this year. Uh, we have budgeted a 7.1% increase in state operating assistance based upon the governor's executive budget. Included is a 4.1% increase in wages to accommodate our purple line BRT service that will start this fall. Of this, the line also includes a modest increase in employee wages. The health insurance line will increase by 6% based on premium renewals. We are adjusting professional services by moving car share, bike share, and marketing services to the operating budget. This is a $1.4 million increase with a corresponding decrease to the capital plan. Purchase transportation is projected to increase by 16%. Most of this covers paratransit services, but also includes Northway and Thruway Express services. Fuel costs will increase by 30%. Current and future conditions remain unclear, so pricing remains elevated. Uh, the budget increase is $1.8 million. The first year of our capital plan includes construction of the Gateway Mobility Hub, upgraded shelters and improvements on the BRT Red Line, and a new parking information system at Rensselaer Rail Station. Thanks to funding from our loan out grant, we will buy buses and construct infrastructure to increase charging capacity at 110 Waterford Avenue. Capital plan also includes fleet replacement for a total of $20 million. The committee recommends approving the fiscal year 2024 operating plan totaling $126,020,418 and a five-year capital plan totaling $274,828,798. Uh, so we just need a motion to... We get a motion on the resolution. Thank you, Jackie. Second by Dave. Thank you, Paul. Hey, what's the first budget you remember? It's about $8 million. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a, little big, a little bigger than that. <laughs> but it's grown. Yeah. I've read in the newspaper that Rensselaer County's mortgage tax is down 14%, and they expect it to keep going down next year. Did you? I didn't see that. Anymore. I guess totally expected. Yeah, we have done well. What are we down this month? 40%? Hey, these are big numbers. Uh, Dave remembers these budget numbers by heart. Um, it's big, modest. Yeah. It's good with numbers. Though. When I walked in the door X number, X number of years ago, um, it was $35 million. But, you know, everything is relative. But it has increased a lot in the last uh, three or four years. Uh, the cost of doing business is just much more expensive. But, you know, the proud part here is it, it, it includes, um, as Mike showed you, you know, the budget still is focused on people, the people who do the work, and it's focused on, you know, initiatives that we're driving. Our third BRT, we 
the only system left state for the BRP. We're, we're opening a third. I mean, that's how far ahead of them we are. And we're not just opening the BRT. We're, there's a busway. Uh, I have to get used to this garden. There's a garden way, you know, through the uh, University of Albany. It connects to the, um, to the Terraman office campus. Uh, it includes new vehicles. It includes the gateway hub. You know, we talked about that mobility hub in downtown Schenectady, that's going to be, I don't use that word transformational, unfortunately it feels government to me, um, but it is going to be transformational. It's in keeping with, if you follow what's happening in downtown Schenectady, there has been a transformation. It's now at the base of State Street, you know, where Schenectady Community College is located, one of our major partners, and then it opens up into a completely redeveloped uh, area that, you know, our good friends at Metroplex have been engaged in for better part of 15 years, so you know, we've made an effort to connect that gateway hub, and I think it's going to be something that we can all be proud of as a community. So it includes a lot of things like that. This is not just a budget that, you know, um, is just like last year and just like the year before. I mean, every year I think there's something in this budget you know, for every year. So I, I'm, I'm proud of it. I do have to tell some of the people who used to work here how what the number is. I saw a couple of them this morning at a wake and were asking me, they said, what? Uh, but I said, ah, you guys are retired. You understand the cost of work. Uh, but it is, it, it's, it's a good budget. It's a solid budget. Appreciate every, I appreciate every system. Then. Yeah, it, it is. And I appreciate everybody's time. You know, we, have, we have committees. We have informal committees. But just about everybody at the board table, and not just about everybody at the board table, which is in. That's what makes it kind of fun. Everybody pitches in. Thank you. Appreciate it. Captain, thanks to you and Mike and staff for pulling this together. Trish, your yeah. first budget, so you did a great job. Good one to start with. Yeah. <coughs> Unless there's any questions, uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> it's approved. All right. And then we, we had uh, one administrative discussion item, which was the Washington Western BRT construction update. Jeremy Smith provided the committee an update on the construction of the Washington Western BRT. Previously completed projects include the relocation of the Crossgate Shelter, construction of the Harriman West E-Tech station, and the station at the University of Albany downtown campus. The garage expansion has also been completed, which includes 25,000 square feet of additional storage space, plus bus washes and lifts, and a new kitchen and break room. The garden way at the University of Albany is more than half complete and includes a semi-dedicated bus lane and multi-use path. We are creating new stations and making roadway improvements <coughs> at Brevador, which is substantially complete. Other improvements include rebranding of stations and traffic signal priority infrastructure. Soon we will break ground on a new roundabout at Crossgate Small Road and I-87. We are on time and on budget for a fall 2023 rollout. Uh, the next meeting of the community will be April 20th here at 110 Waterloo and Ave and via Microsoft Teams, and that concludes my report unless there's any further questions or comments. Anybody have anything for Mike? Thank you so much. Well, just, you know, there's a kind of every meeting having a what's the new cocktail party tidbit. Facilities department, uh, I guess, has all the qualifications now to fly the drone. He's been cleared through the FAA. I've been afraid to ask about insurance, um, but uh, he is a qualified drone pilot. Correct. So, sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm not quite sure I'm comfortable with that, but we'll, we'll fill the left. For clarification, Adam's two feet are firmly on the ground while he's flying them. I know a few people are picturing him flying above the drone. He's firmly on the ground while flying the drone. You just worry about the drone flying into something. That's a good certification for Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like really intense. Yeah. He's the right guy for it. <laughs> but they have no way, no way to show things. Yeah,
Well, I think it was very good. Yeah, it was a yeah, 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 garden plan. Yeah. So who knows what we'll be filming next. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to that. Being in Schenectady. Yes, he'll, he'll gateway. Send us a film. Uh, next on the agenda is the uh, Chief Executive Officer's report. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, you know, keep, keep, this is the way it's supposed to work, right? The committees are supposed to cover the business. So I just a couple of things. Uh, you know, there's a call nationally for transit to tell their story. Uh, it's, it's important for us as we advocate for what we do and how we do it. But I, I just comment that that's old hat for us. We've been doing that and, and we've been telling our story. And we told our story at the... Um, State of CBTA, which I think just about all of you were at, um, it was a, again a resounding success. Uh, we got to show off what we're doing and how we're doing it, but most importantly, to show off our people and our garage. Um, you know, Jamie Caslow, Emily DeVito, and Vanessa Salome have a way of just you know, magically turning it into you know anything you want it to be. Um, it's not a wedding venue, um, but uh, they could probably do that too. But the interesting part about what that did is it spun off, you know, about three or four separate stories that, you know, came through the media. So it, it's interesting how that works and how it, it's, it, it kind of cascades down. In fact, Spectrum News was here without a story. And literally, we walked them through the garage uh, for future stories, for things that, you know, they might contemplate. So you know, our relationship building sort of is always ongoing um, it's impressive the way we've been able to tell our story. It all starts here. It all starts with the budget. It all starts with, you know, having a clear vision for what you want to do. So I appreciate the continued effort of the board and the staff to, to get that done. Uh, we mentioned advocacy. Um, we're in the home stretch. Uh, doesn't look like, for those of you that like on-time budgets, doesn't look like we're going to hit April 1. Um, not quite even sure we're going to hit the first couple of weeks, according to our experts in the advocacy field, a couple of conference calls this morning. Uh, the holidays might get in the way. Uh, you know, you've got Passover and Easter. Uh, frankly, they probably need a little more time. It doesn't look like they've gotten to the, the level of discussion yet where everybody's in a room at the table. I'm not quite sure what that means anymore. But you know that the one-house bills are very favorable uh, for transit, upstate transit. Um, and there are... Um, Funding mechanisms, you know, latched onto, latched onto that, you know, more taxes. Um, but but you know, we're silent on the tax thing, and we don't think it's something that our industry ought to be. We shouldn't be saying we favor this tax or, or that tax, but we do favor uh, increased funding for transit. So we'll see where that goes. Um, we're still we're still in the game, uh, which which is great. Uh, hopefully, it, it, worst case is 7.1 percent. Best case is can't believe it, you know, upwards of 20. Uh, we continue to work on our merger with Glens Falls. Uh, that might take a little longer than we originally anticipated. You know, the Board of Supervisors of Warren County are working their way through this, and they want to join the authority. You know, right now they have nothing to do with uh, the municipally run system uh, you know, that is uh, run by the city of Glens Falls. So there's, there's a, some education that, that we're involved in. We're working closely with the Board of Glens Falls, uh, Scott Sobchik. General manager of, of the system. And basically, we're working with legal, we're working uh, the resource end. Uh, we're also, um, they lost their, their only technician mechanics, so we're substituting for them. Uh, but we're doing what we have to do, and, and that will take its own course. But it may take another couple of weeks. Uh, someone mentioned parking rates. Uh, April 3rd, uh, the rates will increase by $2 across the board. Uh, at the rail station, and we're probably still below uh, our peak those increases. You may have noticed um, during the NCAA basketball tournament, um, we provided shuttle service uh, on Friday only. Um, thousands of basketball fans from around the country. It was, it's, a, it's a premier event. Um, 3,500 people we carry from, to and from Araman and New Albany lots. You know, that's about 15% you know, of the attendees. Uh, I was uh, I was assigned to spy duty and you know, just walking the streets and I heard a lot of people you know, looking for the CDTA stop to get back to the parking lot. So it, it worked. Um, 
I think they're really proud of our, our operations people who, you know, in spite of operator shortages and supervisor shortages, managed to piece it together. And you never would have known last Friday that you know, there, was a, there was no impact to our you know, normal customers. <coughs> Everything worked without, um, without incident. We talked about the LA facility and, and in Mike's report, you know, all the work that we've done here as part of the Purple Line. Uh, we, uh, after many, many years of arm wrestling on this, we installed in the Albany break room, and we've got some time to show a few, a uh, commercial-style kitchen. Um, uh, and we are now going to contract with uh, the Zone Hospitality. Actually, it's called Prime Business Dining by the Zone Hospitality. Uh, they will be here. They will staff it. They will run it. Uh, and they will offer you know, a, wide, a wide menu. We're way past you know, dealing with these individual vendors who run a sub shop at wherever and they can do our, our stuff part time. The nice thing about that, it'll be a full serve uh, uh, opportunity, and there's going to be uh, grab and go stations here so that we'll be able to cover second and third shift workers, and the uh, grab and go will be uh, installed in the Schenectady Control, so we'll be able to extend um, that food service. Into the divisions which we've never been able to do before. So um, that's a project that you know has been sort of in the works for a long, long time, and I'm glad that we're able to do that. If you want to get a load of it, it's going to walk downstairs and show it to you. Also, I'm pleased to tell you that we have um, we will celebrate and formally recognize the Juneteenth holiday on June 19th. Uh, it's a federal, it's a state and federal holiday. Uh, we'll determine the service levels. Uh, coming weeks, but you know, the timing is right. In, in a few minutes, you're going to hear about um, the work that we're doing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it's made sense to, to do that. Um, we announced it to, to our employees uh, yesterday, and it, it, it seemed to be well received. And last but not least, uh, you know, we talked about all these different performance metrics and, and different ways to measure success. Um, I just don't want to let it go by that you know, year to day we, we uh, carry 12 points. I remember uh, a couple of years ago, the depths of the pandemic, you know, ridership was you know, literally in the you-know-what. Uh, we were wondering how much of it would come back, what would our system look like. Uh, it would probably be a reconstructed system. It would probably be much different. At the end of the day, you know, most of our riders are back. We're all, we're all well over 90%. Yeah, there's some parts of the system that are going to look a little different. But it's amazing to me uh, the rebound. Uh, lot, you know, lots of reasons for the rebound. You know, we've talked about it, we can talk about it separately, but it's, it's a long discussion. But you know, to be where we are um, and look at where everyone else is, sort of just for comparison, uh, just an outstanding job by everybody in the room and you know, people who aren't here. Uh, it's the big things and it's the little things, and, and, uh, and we've got this done. We're a different system. Nature of the ridership, the peaks and valleys are different, but it's, it's almost all that. So thank you to everybody for everything you've done. Right. <coughs> My introduction, Joey. We have guest speakers here. The first. Um, uh, we will move on to the board member comments. If anyone has anything to add or say, yeah. Joe? Mr. Chairman, I've got a few notes from the uh, Congress that. Georgie and Pat and I attended a week and a half ago in Washington the at the Apple conference. Um, I'm going to be paraphrasing, so if I got something wrong, please jump in. Uh, first thing is Mitch Londo was there, and that guy's worth the price of admission. <laughs> he was really good, and he was, his deal was, we got the money for you. Spend it. They want us to spend the money. Uh, um, and get more requests in. Third, I mean, something fell off the tree. And he said, "Grab it." Um, <laughs> they talked about no water on contract, but we all know how that goes. Um, and a lot of the stuff was general, nothing with CDPA. Agreement uh, no water on contract. They're talking about more accessibility, which was a 
a good thing when we put a bus stop and we don't have to go three pads past the bus stop. If there's bad sidewalk or something, I'm not 100 feet, they should go ahead and do it. But you got to have the money for it. But uh, it's things like that that they're saying, don't worry about the small stuff. You know it will take care of it. Uh, and street, that would include the street lights and things like that. And they talk about getting more partners and more advertising, which we do constantly. <coughs> uh, more rooms. There seemed to be a consensus of hydrogen is what people are looking at as opposed to electric. Especially the prairie states, Texas, you know, where they've got long haul things. Um, but I think that's going to work for all of us. And uh, just one more thing. Um, well, they talked about bus lanes, which are really interesting in the big cities because it really worked and they were all, they all praised that. Uh, a little harder for us to do, I suppose. Uh, and they talked about promote people. Don't worry about the grease. Get the people that can do the job. And actually, that's something I've been talking about for years. Uh, and that's pretty much it, Mr. Chair. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, you were, uh, we were at the committee meeting the other day. Didn't they talk about launching or uh, trying to hydrogen or talk about it? Oh, yeah. We, piloting. We, you know, listen, we realized that you know, the state's pushing, at least right now, the state's pushing us down the electric path, but we believe strongly, and a lot of the board members we talked about this, we would be remiss if all alternatives. And already we know that you know, when we build a new building, that building has to be flexible to accommodate a lot of different things. Yeah, there's a place in Illinois that makes their own by solar or something, which they say is cheaper than trucking. And I don't know the cost up front. But hey, listen, we have a willing partner that's about, as the crow flies, right. six miles from here. And, you know, we've engaged with Plug Power. <clears throat> the opportunities there are probably endless. You know, we must have to have that kind of conversation. People unplug it. We've been doing ourselves and the community. Yeah. The supply and the stations are, it's been exaggerated that they're dangerous, uh, which I suppose everything is, right? Gas buses and diesel buses. And electric buses. <laughs> and all yeah, we'll go here. Sure. But uh, yeah, um, all in all, it was to just, we got the money to go spend it. Was the biggest thing I think I could do. Except, good at that. except for Mitch. Mitch and the brothers of the ball. <coughs> you made a comment again. All guys got to stick together. That's what he remembered me when he came up here for the conference. So he asked me to walk up by the Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Glad you enjoyed the conference. You're welcome. So there's another one coming up. And it was so cold in Washington. It was so cold. And Pat and I walked the streets. But that's not right. <laughs> Pat and I walk around a lot. I can't <laughs> Pat got an award for the slowest person in all of Washington, New City. He <laughs> is. He had to be a very small one for his life. Thank you for Georgie, any? Yeah, I, I would say in general that's probably one of the best conferences I've attended um, since I've been on this board. And if, if none of y'all have attended this, try to put a new schedule in the future. It's, and I say this like a lot as well. It's really that time you get in between some of the sessions and, and meeting and meeting <coughs> with your peers, other board members, other CEOs of transit systems from across the U.S. Um, it's so beneficial, and I love connecting the pieces. You know, someone was installing a BRT line, and I connected with CARM to just share some lessons learned. I think that's a huge benefit of an organization like APTA. Great. Yeah, I agree. Any, anything else, from Any members? Uh, so we'll move on to our, our next item. Uh, you know, at the Board Operations Committee, we can talk about the work that's been going on for a while. 
on DEI and felt it was time for the board to sort of get a full update of what's happening within the organization. Uh, so uh, we put it on today's agenda, and I'll let Carl make the introduction, but looking forward to it. Yeah, um, we've been trying to find the right time and the right place to do this. I, I think the time is, is right, not because you, but because I, I think we finished enough work here so that we're comfortable with sharing this with you. So I want to introduce our guests. Uh, actually, I'm going to introduce one guest, and she's going to introduce another guest. So John Atreve <coughs> is the founder, executive director, chief executive officer, <laughs> small businesswoman, um, so it means she, she washes the, the dishes and the bottles, so she has to. Uh, we've, known each other, we've known each other for a while, and I knew of, of her reputation um, with this work, so, so when we had the opportunity to work with her, I was personally in professional place. Um, and they have been working with us now for a year? Almost a year. Almost a year. Um, and it's been an interesting year, for sure. Um, and, and, and LB will talk about some of the work that we've done, and you'll see why it's been interesting, because we've done a couple of things. We have completed, um, well, we're in second first, we're almost completed with an organizational assessment, where basically we're asking our employees to tell us what they think about working here at CBK from their perspective. Um, a white, kind of older man's perspective. I don't know how to describe myself. I don't like describing myself. Mature. Mature. <laughs> uh, a, a, female, a female professional's perspective. A, a Hispanic bus operator's uh, female, her perspective. Um, so that has been ongoing. It's almost done, actually. I checked with, with Lauren, and I think we're about 95% done with that data collection. Very difficult for us. Extremely difficult. Uh, and I remember telling Sujata we were going to challenge you, and she said, we're up for it. I don't think they realize how much of a challenge it is because of, of our work. Right? They're, they're just never here. So we employ a lot of different ways. But rather than me tell you about these things, let me have Sujata and LB take over. Maybe 15 minutes if you can. I think you'll enjoy this. Well, I just want to, I'm glad to hear that you have money to spend because Carm hasn't paid me yet. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing he said to me was, did I pay you? But then now you've reinforced it. No, no, you have no, no excuse. Then he's a chairman. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, Sujatha Chaudhary, founder and CEO of Tangible Development. And I have to say, you know, hats off to all of you, especially to Carm coming to us. This is very vulnerable type work, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion. It's, it's leadership taking time <coughs> to really assess their organization, to understand where your employees' perceptions are of the workplace and how can you, as a board, as a leadership team, um, meet the needs in a way that reaches them where they need to be reached. And so, um, you know, very few organizations in the capital region are doing this depth of work. And so hats off to you, Carm, for initiating it, coming to us and being vulnerable about the work. But, you know, um, especially in, as I hear what you're talking about in your board meetings as being essential personnel for the pandemic. And we've been doing work, we did work, very deep work with Price Chopper as well, and the employees and their experiences. So um, this has been great for us, as well as I hope it's been great for you, CDTA, as an experience. But um, just to get into the depth of work we're going to do, um, our director of operations, LB, is going to go through the depth of the work and the nuance it takes to really understand diversity, equity, inclusion in an organization. So thanks for having us. Um, can't wait to get paid. And LB, can go ahead. in the front, is that for the slide? Sure. Happy to go. All right. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Vanessa, for this. Um, my name is LB. I am the Director of Operations and Innovation and Annual Development. I'm here to talk about this project, but much of the kudos will go to the project. They, I realize this says March 30th. I realized this morning after I set the slides up, today is not the 30th. I lost a whole darn day. Today. I lost a whole day. So you're, I'm not trying to gaslight you. It is only the 29th. I realize now that I was a day off, but here we are. We're, I'm here. If you can go to the next slide, Vanessa. I want to really elevate our team, um, a little bit of, of how we do things at Tangible Development. We're really collaborative. As you can see, visually, we're a pretty diverse team. 
All of our projects are touched by everybody on our team in multiple ways. We have a complexity of lived experience, but also professional experience that contribute to the projects. And the projects that we, we run are pretty complex and are heavy lifts. Um, the project lead for, for CDTA is our colleague, Dr. Bree Becker, the first uh, face up on the screen. But uh, as I'm shouting out Dr. Bree on our side, it is um, worthwhile and really important to shout out the CDTA project leads, Kelly, Lauren, Jamie's been super instrumental in, in the nitty gritty in the weeds of this project. That All of the credit goes really to them and on, on, uh, Dr. Bree on our side. Because there are communication challenges with this project. We realized early on that uh, we had to think outside of the box when it came to uh, data collection and reaching all of your employees because we couldn't run um, just an a, a online survey because of the challenges around um, email addresses. And if we were to only run an online survey through email, we would miss the very populations that we needed to hear from the most. Um, and so that group has worked really creatively and for a long time to ensure that we are uh, um, going through every nook and cranny of uh, trying to reach as many people as possible. So let's talk a little bit about the project. There's a couple pieces to it, as Carmen was alluding. If you go to the next slide, Vanessa, thank you. And the next slide, actually. Um, the big goals and the why. Um, you know, the world has changed in many ways since the pandemic, and we know that the most recent conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion was the catalyst for where we are now is the murder of George Floyd back in 2020 and Breonna Taylor and all of the social and political unrest that the United States was going through. A lot of organizations realize that the way we have been going about diversity, equity, inclusion, relying on training, implicit bias training, and all of that, was not really making a lot of move, movement um, in how we do things. And so um, the work that we do is taking a look at systemic change. We're looking for um, policy and practice and organizational change through a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. So the goals of this project was to understand at CDTA, what is the current state of diversity, equity, and inclusion from an organizational perspective? And so that's what all of these bullet points are, are alluding to, and we can share the slides. We are looking at organizational structure and climate. We are looking at the experience of employees. We're looking at policy and practice. We are looking at hiring processes. We're looking at experiences with hiring processes. And we're doing this so that we are not um, over-individualizing a problem. Uh, and we are taking a look at the places that the organization as an employer is responsible for change. For a lot of times, we, uh, for a long time, we've been relying on kind of grassroots efforts to make change bottom up. The model that we come in with is we're gonna start at the top and um, shift the responsibility for organizational change around equity and inclusion to senior leaders and, and at the top of an organization so that when the grassroots folks are still doing their thing, as they should, and senior leadership should just taking more responsibility, you have kind of more coverage across an organization and change is, is more possible. So if you go to the next slide, what we're attempting to do through this assessment is give you uh, an analysis and um, kind of a, a an, an analysis and a, and a prognosis, a diagnosis, if you will, of where CDTA is as an organization on a maturity model of diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is a, a model of where organizations can be in the kind of current state of diversity, equity, and inclusion work in terms of organizational maturity. You have your unaware organizations. Those are the organizations that are actively resisting change. Your compliant organizations that are doing what is kind of state or federally required around diversity, equity, inclusion. And then we, as we move along this continuum, uh, organizations moving into strategic places where they're creating strategic goals and they're really thinking outside of the box and beyond compliance around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, beyond strategic is integrated. The integrated organization takes diversity, equity, and inclusion and weaves it into everybody's job function, role, and responsibility. So from procurement to facilities to hiring practices to um, you know anything that you can imagine that exists within an organization taking that lens and putting it on top of uh, everything that a, an organization does. And then at the end of this continuum, you have your disruptors. These are the organizations that are, in, in your sector, uh, the, the biggest risk takers, the ones that are kind of pushing the box and pushing the envelope around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So some practices that you might be familiar in the disruptive space. Uh, you remember a couple of years ago, Starbucks had that incident in one of their stores, um, um, some black men were waiting for a friend and didn't buy any product and they, the, the baristas, someone complained and the baristas called the cops on, on them. 
Um, in response to that, Starbucks shut their whole stores down across the country for a day and made everybody go through racial equity training. At the time, that was a pretty disruptive practice. Now, at this state, I don't know if we would call Starbucks a disruptive organization, but there are disruptive practices in different sectors that are taking more risk, showing uh, more willingness to uh, make change as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I, I, go off, I go through all of this big picture-wise is to um, say that what we're doing with our analysis, and I'm gonna show you the, the outputs of our analysis. Is that shaking the new? Oh, y'all are used to that, okay. <laughs> okay, all right, so I'm gonna make sure I It's truly disruptive. I had to eat lunch today. I didn't know if I was like, have, I was gonna pass out. Um, <laughs> We're gonna, we're gonna figure out, based on what your staff tell us, a uh, policy and practice review and kind of our overall analysis where CBTA fits on this maturity model as an organization. That's not to say that there aren't people or divisions or practices, even within your advocacy efforts, that we could probably chart further along, but overall we wanna get a sense of where you are to be able to give you recommendations to move you along in this maturity model where you want to go. We're not gonna push anybody to be as disruptive if they don't want to be. It's gonna be, we're, we're guiding you to where you wanna be. All right, we can move this. So one of the uh, big outputs that preceded all of the assessments was leadership readiness. And what was unique about CDTA's leadership readiness work is we always um, have leadership readiness training. Uh, our standard curriculum is, is nine hours of training that we do with leadership teams that are going through an assessment with us. Um, and and that, that curriculum, the nine hours, is a high-level overview of the necessary knowledge and skills that leaders need to effectively manage long-term organizational change as it relates to diversity and inclusion. We, Sujata and I initially did 10 hours with your leadership team, I think a while back now, like in 2021 even, I think maybe it was fall of 2020, or beginning of 2022, that's what it was, beginning of, who knows, time is a construct. After those 10 hours, uh, we met with Carmen and, and um, talked about deeper training for that leadership group and ended up doing um, an additional 16 hours of leadership readiness training with many of the people in this room, a lot of familiar faces around, around the outside of the, of the space here. So your leadership team went through leadership readiness. So in that, the learning outcomes for that was a common foundation and language around diversity, equity, inclusion, taking steps that leadership needs to, to do uh, to lead organizational change. And we did a lot of team-oriented work. Um, we can't ask our employees to engage in diversity, equity, inclusion work if leadership doesn't have the knowledge and skills to model that change. So a lot of our time together in the fall, uh, the, that group put up with me every two weeks over the course of, course of four months um, to really develop individual skills, skills as a team, and then a baseline understanding of what this work entails uh, as we prepare to show the assessment. So kudos to the 26 hours that CARB's leadership team put in that's above and beyond really any leadership team that, uh, in our portfolio has ever committed to long term. So that was fun and happy to hear uh, the folks that were there, their, their impressions of what they got out of it afterwards. Okay, go ahead. The other activities and deliverables that we were talking about, the assessment. So uh, a policy and practice review, so a review of all current policies and practices that were shared with us. Our DEI climate assessment tool, our DEI CAP, we we'll can give you a little bit more insight on that tool in a minute. 15 focus groups, uh, 15 interviews, individual interviews with CDTA employees, and then we're gonna use all that data and provide an overview and analysis with recommendations for short and long-term next steps uh, for CDTA. So go ahead. So I wanna give you a little bit of an insight in terms of what, what kind of data we collected. Our tool was created, we created this customized tool with the Siena College Research Institute, our colleagues over at, uh, at Siena. They are the experts in perception surveys. So our survey is a perception-based survey. We are not collecting individual experience with individual experiences of discrimination, because that would set up the organization and individuals in a potential liability, in a legal liability place. If someone reported us that something happened, we might have to report it to you. Our survey is perception-based. So if you scroll up, we're looking at four main, uh, four main buckets here. We're looking at institutional culture and structure. So how do, your, how do your employees perceive the organizational culture around diversity, equity, and inclusion? How authentic do they feel like the efforts are? How inclusive do they feel like the, the organizational culture is? Institutional structure is measuring um, what policies and practices your employees uh, uh, are experiencing that are in place that support diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
But we also measure personal beliefs and practices. We want to get a sense of how much do, you, do your employees believe in the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how comfortable and empowered do they feel to act on those beliefs, right? So we often see, particularly in, in human services, education, nonprofit sector, high beliefs around diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, but a gap between beliefs and practices, right? So everybody espouses these values of inclusion, but when it comes to um, addressing bias or correcting someone by mispronouncing their name or misgendering someone, there's a gap between belief and action. And so we're likely to see this, I haven't seen your numbers, but likely this is a common theme we see across all uh, um, clients that there's a gap between beliefs and practice. There's often a gap between culture and structure. So big picture, that's what, that's what we're measuring. We also measure how inclusive your employees perceive the organization to be for all of these groups of people. You'll see on this continuum that there are groups that we typically think about when we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, people of color, uh, uh, people that are, do not identify as Christian, um, uh, people with disabilities, people who are not US citizens, LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ people. But we also have groups that are historically centered and, and what we consider the marginalized groups and the privileged groups, white folks, men, uh, folks of high socioeconomic status, things like that. So we're, we're getting a perception of how included your employees feel like these groups are in comparison to each other. So we can run the data and say, um, folks of color place the organization on a scale of one to 10, one being not inclusive at all and threatening, 10 being the most inclusive, uh, your folks of color rate the organization for white folks at a 9.8. White folks in the organization put white folks at a 9.8. So there might be some agreement there. We can run the data and say folks of color rate the organization for folks of color at a 7.8. But white folks rate the organization for people of color at an 8.2 or something like that. We'll be able to see the difference in perception of the organization based on uh, uh, identity demographics, because in addition to these two components, we do a full demographic profile. So you have EEO data, because lots of folks have EEO data, but we know that EEO data is limited, right? It gives us binary racial identity, gives us binary gender, um, and that's about it. Uh, we ask uh, a much more robust demographic profile. So all the identities that you see on here, um, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, disability status, immigration status, um, income level, religion, all disaggregated. So you're going to have a very robust demographic profile that will give you a much clearer, truer snapshot of who, uh, of the diversity within your, within CDTA. A couple more slides and I'm happy to answer questions. Focus groups, like I said, there are 15 uh, plus one-on-one -on -one interviews. If you scroll down to the next one, I'm going to show you the actual list. That is much smaller. So I'll, I'll read them. We, we did uh, focus groups for uh, specifically for black, indigenous, people of color, women, managers and supervisors, the leadership team, um, customer service folks, maintenance and transportation folks, foreman, transportation supervisors, um, a couple of repeats there, so multiple sessions for these groups, and authority staff, and then an open session. So we're trying to hit as many pockets and different groups of people as possible and um, ensure that as many voices that want to participate in the process are able to participate in the process. Next steps, uh, we are about done with data collection. We are then, we do kind of go behind the scenes and pull all the data together, look for themes, uh, do the analysis, write the report, come back to the leadership team and give the report and then we socialize based on the recommendations of the leadership team. We always recommend that we, we socialize and we share some data, some, some part of the story with all staff so that folks can see where their feedback went. Um, and, but we will take the lead with the leadership team based on what and when and how to share that data when, when it's time. So we're targeting that for, for June. Can I help you if I could add? So, Please. you know, um, the point of the data collection, right? So we do the quantitative and the qualitative. The tool that we are proprietary tool is the quantitative data collection, right? And it'll give you a score. The policy practice review and the focus groups are the qualitative data that tell us and inform us why the numbers skewed, which way they skewed. The reason for the data collection and the scoring and the qualitative and quantitative is then to take it, come up with a report that gives you recommendations as to how you can operationalize diversity, equity, inclusion into your organization. 
Because diversity, equity, inclusion is such a nebulous concept. It's about behavior, it's about perception, it's about beliefs, it's about practices, right? And that's where, that's where it becomes a challenge for organizations. How do you take this data and then actually do something concrete with it and operationalize it in an organization? And that's what we come in to help you do, right? So that's the reason for the data collection. It's, it's not only to understand the experiences, but also how do we then help CTA operationalize it with concrete measures? Are you a for-profit consulting organization? Yeah. Is that, <clears throat> where do you get your parameters from? The government tell you, we need this, we need that? No, we get our parameters through research, right? Through research, best practices, we have PhDs on staff, we have data analysts on staff. Um, you know, honestly, there are no standards for diversity, equity, inclusion. But we do sit on a national foundation called RAND, and we are helping them lead actual standards for diversity, equity, inclusion, which is why we as an organization don't participate in certification programs, because, you know, you'll see these organizations like Cornell and so on will do these DEI certification programs, but really a certification program doesn't have standards to follow, and we're leading the standard. So we're developing the standard. We're working with the national organizations developing the standards. Did that answer your question? Uh, almost. Are you going to, at the end of this, are you going to give us a list and say, this is what you need to do? Yes. The one thing I will say is we have all of our reports. There, There is legal parameters that we have to stay within, right? So we have all our reports um, run through our legal team just to make sure that we are, you know, our recommendations are staying in sound company. So, so, you know, I, I badly wanted to share this, but right, I, we needed the right time, and, and for a while, for, as L, LB pointed out, I mean, almost everybody here has been involved in this. So it was, it, we were at the grind point, and, and we didn't have anything, I didn't have anything to tell you. I, I wasn't even sure what would we tell you. Um, but now we're to the point here, we're, we're, we're just about done with, with this part of it. And I think you know the report will be insightful, uh, interesting. Um, but as both of you, you gotta have, have said, you know, the, that for as hard as this has been, that might have been the, this might be the easy part, right? Because the next part is how do you sort of take what we learn and 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 where we need to change, change, where we need to do the same, do it, do it, and where we need to be better, be better. That. That will, will be the test for us. But if, if you know the last year has been any indication, we'll get there. Um, we'll get there because you know people have committed to this. And it's not easy. Um, it's it, it's a major project in and of itself that we have been running while we do everything else. And you know there were times where like, oh no, you're blocking out, and it never was two hours. It was always. Two and a half, you know, every now and then I need to jot it for a cup of coffee. <laughs> oh my god. And just and hang we in. Are, this is tough work. So I wanted to share the tough work with you. And we would be the enforcement agency. I, that's not a good term. But yeah, not a good term at all. We're not, not going to enforce anything. I, I don't want to use the word. I don't even know what we mean by enforce. The implementation is such a Okay. Yeah, who's going to just. Who's going to make sure that. John Jones is doing treating his fellow or employee. I mean, this is a big. It is. This is it's, a big deal. It's not a yes or a no, and it's not a. It's not a check a box or not check a box. You know, one of the slides up there can help me. Help me it. Yeah. I mean, culture. Culture is. Yeah. You don't change. <coughs> I'm looking, you're not going to change culture overnight. So, so to answer right. your question, right, um, this is not about any one individual. It's about the individuals in the organization. So we do people work, so we do individual work, right? We do teamwork, we do organizational work. And so really, to address your question, who is going to be, it's, there's multiple layers that we have to create checks and accountability around, right? So we have to create accountability within the individual. We create accountability within the team and measures, 
how do you keep accountable to your team? How do you keep accountable to the organization? How do you keep leadership accountable to the overall initiative? Right? So there are checkpoints everywhere. I think so, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Accountability. Accountability. Typically, after a project like this, either with us or on an, on their own, organizations will go through some kind of either strategic planning around DEI or action planning around DEI to take the recommendations and prioritize it because there's a lot of data. We always get a lot of data. There's always, you know, the, the stuff that we find in our report you could probably use for years to come because there's so much that, that of change. Even in the most progressive of an organization that's been doing this, this is an evolution. Um, so the activity that would follow this at some point would be some kind of prioritizing and planning efforts around what to do in the short term and then what to do in the long term will require some infrastructure and longer term change. But that's what happens after a project like this. I also want to point out that you know, we are involved uh, with APTA's work on this and APTA has, has made this a priority. Um, and we are one of 100 signatories yeah, mark. So 167 <laughs> systems that are engaged in this. So, and Warren uh, is our rep to the. I, I jump up, Kelly and I jump on occasion, but Warren is deep into this. Um, and really, what it's been good for, I think, and Warren, continue here, is we're able to find out what others are doing, and, you know, and learn from others. Absolutely, I can tell just based on the conversations that we seem to be kind of in the the average of what's happening nationally from folks that aren't doing really anything and trying to catch up and folks that, you know, have gone through these kind of processes already, you know, I've been part of groups talking about, you know, how to do a climate assessment and other things like that. And so I've been able to kind of see if this is where the dial is, is turning towards uh, with transportation nationally and we're in the middle of that. <coughs> it's a process. Yeah. <laughs> Could you tell us who is a leader in the, who's like the best company out there? I know you can't mention names, but um, <laughs> are you looking at high tech, or is high tech, are they more of an understanding of both? You know what, I think it's a spectrum. I think it's a spectrum, because we have clients that are in the tech industry, clients like large banking institutions, hospital systems, uh, transportation systems. Uh, educational institutions. I think it depends on um, uh, also where they're located, right? So if you're in a more urban environment, you tend to be a little more progressive <coughs> by nature of your population and your employee population, right? If you get into um, areas like we have, and we can tell you who they are, we can't tell you what we do with them, but like Hudson Headwaters Health Network, right? They're in Glens Falls and north, north of us. And so their population is very different from the population of CBTA employees. So when we talk about progressive, it depends on who we're speaking about from, an, from a workforce and population standpoint. But it varies. When you ask me about an industry, it varies. It varies. You can have uh, you know, an industry leader in the tech industry who isn't really embarking on this work who is doing more com compliance related work. And then you can have somebody in the industry that's really progressive, right? So we can't right now, there's no true benchmarking tool, which is why we designed this tool. Um, the, t the CAT is our trademark proprietary tool. Now we've collected enough robust data that we're gonna be able to benchmark industries and companies in it and be able to give you an actual number. <coughs> So you can, you'll be able to tell us, well, Google is real a leader. Um. And you know, again, if you, if you noticed in the maturity model, right, there were dotted lines on those boxes because you can be really progressive in maybe the way you do recruitment and hiring, but you may not be really thinking forward about how you do uh, vendor selection, right? And are you looking at your vendor selection with a DEI lens? So there's areas in an organization that could be super progressive in areas that aren't. I mean, Google's been under the microscope around DEI for years now. What they claim to be DEI work wasn't really, it was more pre prescriptive type, check the box work, right? They were the leaders in implicit bias training. I mean, they, they were doing that left and right in about 
10 years ago, and that didn't go so well for them when you actually looked at when they did a climate survey in their organization of what these behaviors were and the practices were. So, you know, it depends. It's just, you know, this is a continuous dynamic journey that you can't pinpoint in the now you can maybe pinpoint it, but five years from now it might look different. Yeah. I, just an observation. And to answer some of your question, it, it's all through the perspective of the employee. Yes. So if our employees feel that they are in a workplace that is supportive of them, isn't that the end goal? Yes. Because you can't, CBTA is not going to match next to any other organization exactly. with its location, its people, its whatever. Yeah. So if you're your scoring, the way that your rating is, is from those folks that are doing the exactly. assessment. Exactly. And that's why we always say, and Ellie can speak to this too, right? That we always say, stop comparing to other organizations. Look in, internal to your organization and the data we collect for you and what can we do there, right? Because people immediately want to benchmark <coughs> against another uh, transit authority. Well, their population is so different from yours, right? Just us and Glenn Smalls. Glenn Smalls, right? He's different. You know, we, we work with Albany Med and we work with Hudson Headwaters, totally different patient population base, right? We can't do cookie cutter work. That's why we don't do it. Okay. So everything we've done has been personalized to us. You know, the 26 hours with, with LB and, and a little subjective. <laughs> it was all us. There was no Google Heads up, heads up, headwaters. It was all us, and the, the the outreach survey, whatever we're calling it, focus group, because it's so many different things. It's all us, and you're right, Dan. It, it is the perspective of our employees. How how do they feel about working here? You know, and I, I'm not really all that concerned about the numbers. You know, how, how do you feel about it? Is this a comfortable place for you? Everything you bring to the table, because everybody, everybody here is different, right? Everybody brings something different to the table, and that's really what we're trying to really get into. Um, really tough work, um, and, and as far as the needle is concerned, these aren't the types of needles that you're able to move quickly. You know, these are needles that will likely move slowly, but as long as we're moving the needle in the right direction, I think we will all be. Happy. I think we'll have some, some, some tools to help us. Because right now, if you ask me, I couldn't tell you what needles we ought to be looking for. I think in a few months, you know, we'll have a better idea. What well, the Kelly survey has to come in here someplace, right? The one that she's doing with employees. How you? Is that is part it, of this whole? Is well, that the, the contract negotiation? Survey, that one? No, how, does, how do employees feel about working here? That is this one. That's this one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. These are surveys and focus groups and meetings. Yeah. And, and frankly, <coughs> Kelly, what we want to do is not, there are no managers leading this. Zero. It's all staffed by Kim Kimberdell. <coughs> Management may participate. No manager leads this work ever. Am I right about that? Right, yeah. ever. At least today. I mean, yeah. It's a time and place for us. But and the reason no for that is, is and, 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 and you know, it's great that CBTA recognized it, is because, again, we're asking questions, yeah. right? We're asking vulnerable questions with data anonymity, meaning you will never know who said what, and you will never be able to associate it, right? And an independent party coming in, and us, and we do it through comms work, and we work very closely with Jamie as to how to roll this out, right, that resonated. It had CBT's feel and language, but to still reach the population for them to develop trust through tangible development to be able to open up and answer those questions, right? And so that they know that they can give us honest, sincere, vulnerable responses so that we can give you honest and real data at that moment, capture it, so that we can then convert it into recommendations based on our findings. So the independent piece of it and the anonymity piece of it has been crucial, crucial, crucial. So you're talking bus cleaner, bus driver, everybody. 
Everybody. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody. That was the biggest challenge, was getting sure. out to those folks. And that's really the, the biggest piece that Lauren had to deal with, was how do we figure out ways to get in front of them? What's the best way to um, administer the survey? Were there people that were afraid of the survey but would be more open to um, a focus group with other individuals, or maybe they were more comfortable with a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So we had, you know, we did everything we could to make it as, um, you know, accessible. It, yeah, accessible to everybody. It was done at night. There were focus groups on weekends. There, anything we could to try to get it in front of people. But you know, Lauren was. She was the one that was coming up with the logistics and working with Tangible to try to get in front of as many people as we could. You have so many field people here, as does Albany County, I'm sure. I mean, how do you reach these people? I think we got to them. I really do. I think we got to them. And then the other challenge was speaking in, I don't mean languages, French and Italian, in languages that people could understand and embrace. Right? What we mean by that is, if it's something that is just not recognizable, they're, they're not going to embrace it. And then, you know, what does it mean to them? And is it, it had to be non-threatening. I mean, there were so many layers, and this focus group, frankly, might not look anything like that focus group, because it, in order for this focus group to, to participate, it had to be different than this book. I mean, the juggling that's gone on here in terms of different levels has been, pretty, for me, very interesting to watch. Can you hope to have a blend at some point in time? Is that what you do? Are you trying to accomplish that? <clears throat> um, clarify your question. I'm yeah. not sure I'm understanding. Can we get a brand new bus cleaner to think along the same lines as car, or can, does car think along the same lines as they do? Um, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, we're, there's a couple layers to it. So we're not trying to get anyone to think like anybody else or, or, or be like anybody else. What we're, one, trying to do, first thing, is get a, as real, clear, honest, understanding of the lived experiences of everybody in the organization as an employee of CTA, right? Like, it's really based on being an employee. There are, there are other factors that happen in our lives outside of our work life that influence this, no doubt. But how do folks feel like CDTA is either helping, hurting, impacting their lived experience based on being a person of color, being a woman, being um, a leader, being a manager, being not a manager, being a being a bus operator, being um, being in HR, so I'm trying to get a clear. That's that's what this process is. What is the experiences folks are having? With that, we find the themes across the data to get an understanding of what bubbles up that we can say is the culture of CBTA. If if one person says one thing and we don't see any other evidence of that of that experience anywhere else in the data, it's not a culture issue doesn't mean that that's not real for that person, but it's not culturally what's happening. So typically, I just finished a report, actually, very early this morning. You saw me yawning a lot. It's because I was up at four finishing up a project. Typically, in organizational work, we see um, um, conflict avoidance and trouble with uh, folks um, mitigating, navigating conflict. Experiences with bias and discrimination, uh, particularly around the groups that, that are marginalized, so folks of color, women, LGBT folks, folks with disabilities, things that folks you, you would think. Um, uh, themes we typically hear is what we, we want to get an understanding, what's the average, where's the understanding of diversity, equity, inclusion, and knowledge across the staff levels um, so that we can recommend trainings. So oftentimes the recommendations might be around training, it might be around policy or practice change, it might be around structure, right? So. A lot of times we might recommend that either an organization hire a chief diversity officer or create employee resource groups 
for a DEI committee to give some structure and placement within the organizational framework specifically for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So those, we take that to, to, to make recommendations around what you can actually do as an employer, not to change anybody's opinions, beliefs, identities at all, but really what's happening and what can we do in the spirit of making it a more diverse place, literally diverse, a more equitable place, and a more inclusive place. That's the ultimate. I think that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. So, in a nutshell, <laughs> um, a little longer than we thought. But listen, this is this is uh, timely stuff, interesting stuff. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can really talk about this stuff for, for a long time. But I think LB's last statement is really what this is trying to do. Um, we'll get the report. We'll get some recommendations. You know, uh, we're not expecting miracles. Um, this will take a long time to move the needle because I'm sure there are going to be recommendations. Like, no, uh, but at the end of the day, we want to make CDTA a better place. We want to make CDTA a better place for other people who work here. Um, we want to make it, you know, um, more open, more inviting, and, and you know, more. I keep going back to more inclusive. You know, if it's more inclusive, it will be better. Good work, and it's, it's good work by everybody involved. I, we wanted to get up to speed. I think the next <coughs> touch point will probably be when we have some digestible information from the report, because I'm sure it's going to be, you know, not good. But, you know, at least for me, right now. <laughs> they, they've done great work, and I kind of hope we should be able to just quick update. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, our next meeting is on uh, April 26, 12 noon, right here at 110 Waterbury Avenue. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.